Uh, Matt Nelson, I'm a solutions architect with Optiv, which is a, a huge security company based out of Denver. I myself am based out of uh, West Michigan, um, Grand Rapids area, uh, and uh, also president of the local Cloud Security Alliance chapter, which I will talk a little bit about the Cloud Security Alliance, at least in terms of um, uh, some training and education um, that, that, that they offer that you guys can take advantage of as well. So. Um, cloudy with a chance security. Uh, that's kind of my catchphrase. So uh, I totally stole that from the cartoon and they probably stole it from someone else anyways. Um, so what I want to talk about today is, um, you know, like some real basics of what is the cloud, some of the different types of clouds that are out there. Then I want to talk about securing the cloud and maybe how there's a little bit of differences, in, um, you know, especially if you're, you're looking at going into a security role. If you want to be focused on, um, you know, cloud security, it is a little bit different and there's some stuff that you need to know. Um, some of the different frameworks that are out there that you can learn and study and get familiar with to help uh, from, a, from an employment standpoint. And then um, some of the governance and other stuff that is different in, in the cloud. Um, so with that, uh, let's just jump into a lot of people when they think of the cloud. Uh, they think of, you know, a big, scary Godzilla looking cloud monster that's out there. And it's very scary for a lot of people to, to think of, you know, I want to go into security or I want to go into technology, but I don't know this cloud thing. And what is it? Um, what that causes is something called nephophobia, which is a real thing that I learned about, which is the fear of clouds. Um, so <laughs> it's true. It's real. I, fascinating. Um, uh, so I won't read all this stuff to you guys, obviously, but uh, the, the first, what, four um, bullet points there are actual real symptoms of someone that has nephophobia. Um, the last one I wrote in there because I think um, people that have a fear of cloud, at least in the security technology terms that we're talking about, uh, it, it can definitely be a reason why people never want to take a look at moving into a security role or a tech role, or they're really afraid to do it. So what I want is for all of us by the end of this to overcome our nephophobia and, uh, um, you know, realize that it's, it's really not that scary. It's not a big um, giant Godzilla in the, in the sky. It's, it's, a, it's a puffy, soft, friendly place mostly. So let's talk about what is cloud because that honestly is something that is really confusing for a lot of people um it's 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 really just made up of three things um it's just processing power right? just processors and memory spinning it's storage right so every time you copy something up to one drive or box or you know some sort of uh, uh other you know internal corporate cloud storage it's a bunch of uh hard drives and it's networks everywhere. So this is not a whole lot different than, uh, you know, what you would traditionally see in a data center, right? It's, it's still servers, it's someone else's servers, it's still running on a network, it's just ginormous networks that span across the globe instead of one that spans across the office space. Um, and it's still storage and hard drives just on a scale that's almost uncomputable. The thing about the cloud though, when, when we think of this as like some new scary technology, it really isn't. Um, it's been around for a long, long time actually. Um, I, I think some of these, uh, I don't, you guys are all way younger than I am. So some of you may not remember things like Napster, right? The, the original way of pirating music. Um, that was born in the cloud. Um, so if you ever, you know, downloaded some sort of music or something else off of Napster, you were using the cloud. Hotmail, uh, any of the online email services that we've been using forever, those were built and born in the cloud, um, have always been there. So, you know, I'm, I'm still using my at live account, which I've had for like 15 years or something. No, I've had people like, you still have a live account. I'm like, it's like one step off of an AOL account, but um, always been in the cloud. Amazon, a very famous cloud-based book selling company. Uh, does anybody remember when Amazon was just about books? That's, that's all they did, they sold books. Um, it was a really cool place to sell books. And uh, 
Born in the Cloud, now, um, of course, Amazon. Uh, some interesting stuff about Amazon, actually. Uh, I don't know if you know, Amazon uses up, hey, Katia. Um, she came in and waved, so. Um, uh, Amazon uses about 3% of the electricity uh, used in the United States. So uh, that's how big of a company they've come from being a, a small online bookseller to now consuming 3% of the electricity that's used in this country is mind boggling. Um, you know, Xbox Live, for any gamers that have been out there, uh, any of the, you know, whether it's the PlayStation or, or Xbox, those systems have been cloud-based systems forever. So again, this is not new stuff. This has all been around for a while. Um, I like Dogpile that's on there. That was like a search engine way back in the day that probably no one here has ever used or heard of before. Um, and then, you know, of course, things like Netflix. Um, Netflix kind of won because they were the cloud when Blockbuster wasn't. And it was just made things a little bit easier. And, and it was really the demise of, of uh, um, late fees. <laughs> the demise of late fees, which I'm happy for because I was always late. Uh, <laughs> So uh, when we look at the big cloud providers that are out there, um, there's really only three, uh, maybe with the fourth. Uh, AWS, both from, a, um, you know, like a traditional cloud provider, as well as an infrastructure as a service. And I'll talk about those a little bit. Amazon by far is the winner. Um, you know, they make a huge they they make a huge percentage of their uh, income off of being a cloud provider, even more than, um, you know, books or whatever else that they're selling us these days. Uh, Microsoft certainly comes in a very close second on all of that stuff. Uh, and then um, Google and then Alibaba is, is Chinese based, is huge over there for legal and compliance and some other reasons is not as big uh, in the United States. But if any of you either are or are looking to um, work for global companies that maybe have a presence in, uh, in China, you are certainly gonna run into uh, to Alibaba cloud over there. Um, Alibaba, interestingly enough, I don't know if anybody knows, but they, they started as like a wholesaler company of buying you know, products out of China that took a page out of um, Amazon's playbook and, and realized there's a whole ton of money to be made in this space. Um, there's a lot of other bit players, as you can see. This is a, just a Gartner Quadrant. Everybody, anybody not familiar with Gartner Quadrants, I guess? Feel free to unmute or mute or throw in the chat or something. Um, there's, a, there's a big, and I can't see the chat, so Joanna, if anything comes in, let me know. Um, Gardner is a huge company that creates these four boxes and puts companies in it in all these different spaces. Um, you always want to be in the upper right hand quadrant. That's the leaders quadrant. Um, if you're a technology provider, um, companies do uh, all sorts of crazy things, including I think probably pay Gartner money to get in the upper right quadrant. I didn't say that or we're not recording. Um, but uh, um, that, that's we are where recording. Dang it, Joanna. I didn't say that. I that. think everybody knows that company. <laughs> um, so anyways, these are the big ones. So if you're looking at things like, um, you know, cloud certifications, uh, AWS has several of them. I mean, they are far and away the, the big dog um, out there. So, you know, if you're looking at, at, you know, where should I start if I want to get, uh, you know, get into doing cloud um, AWS practitioner, there's some other um, AWS uh, certifications out there, would be a great place to start. Um, Microsoft certainly and always and forever, all of their certifications have, you know, at least as far as certifications go, and we could have that conversation for an hour, um, whether they're valuable or not. Um, uh, but anyways, they're, they're always good. I mean, it's definitely good when you're trying to get past human resources needs and other things like that or scanning things that, that HR systems do. Um, uh, HR system, I don't know if this is a slight detraction, but um, your, and, and Katya could definitely um, talk about this as well. Um, those scan every single one of those companies. Anytime you're putting in an application, 
they all go through scanners before they ever touch a, a human's eyes or are in front of a human's eyes. So those sorts of keywords and certifications, well, I know people that have 30 certifications after their title that don't know anything. And I also know people that don't have certifications that I think are pretty smart. So I don't know that I always put a lot of credence into them when it comes to, uh, you know, the actual talent of someone, but it definitely can help you um, in the job market. Uh, I'll talk about Microsoft a little bit because that's the one that um, I think, you know, maybe Azure most people are probably familiar with. But um, if you look at uh, this is all the places that Microsoft has data centers. Um, so when someone is going out and building up a new server or building new infrastructure, um, getting an application, maybe your company is purchasing an application that's running on Azure. Um, it's running on this. Um, uh, all of these different data centers uh, around the globe to ensure that there's, you know, uh, minimal downtime ever as possible and that there's always redundancy and wherever people are logging in, right? Because if you're running a website um, or some sort of SaaS based application, you may have people logging in from all over the country. Well, if you're, you know, way over here and, you know, uh, China somewhere, if you're having to log into a server that's back in the United States, you're gonna have some latency. So um, Microsoft has made sure that they have these data centers everywhere. And by data centers, I mean giant data centers. Um, these are a couple of aerial photos of some real um, uh, Microsoft data centers. And as you can see, they're huge. Um, and and they, the. It's amazing uh, how they how they bring in servers. It's unlike anything that if if you've only ever worked in a you know at a company and they they have a data center, or you have a few servers somewhere. This is that on a whole different scale, um, and really how they they look at how servers are looked at in the cloud is uh, their cattle, right? So. Um, you know, if you've worked for a company that has 50 servers somewhere or, uh, you know, as a smaller shop, you treat them like pets or back in the day when everything was on prem. Uh, man, I remember I've racked so many servers, I, I couldn't even count them. Um, I, I knew them, we named them, we, uh, you know, we, we took special care of their cabling, we made sure the air conditioning was right. AWS, Microsoft, they don't care. This is, they are not pets, they're cattle. Um, the average life, actually, I'll, I'll just ask and throw in the chat or unmute yourself. How, so the average server lifespan in a data center, a traditional data center is about three years, give or take. Um, anyone have any ideas how long a server lasts inside of a Microsoft Azure data center? Joanna, let me know if anybody throws a guess in the chat. Jared says four years. One month, they, one month. So, and how they actually bring these servers in are on almost like semis where everything is pre-configured and pre-racked and they back these things in and the whole set of like racks and racks of um, all these servers gets put in place and plugged in and it runs. And then about a month later, they're taken out of there and rebuilt or destroyed or Whatever the, whatever is done to them. This is truly just massive scale uh, that, that they're doing this stuff on. So um, you thinking of uh, your, uh, your service in the cloud, just think of cattle. Uh, so lots of different types of uh, cloud out there. Um, uh, there's infrastructure as a service. I love, I hate acronyms. I, the Cloud Security Alliance, we do this thing, we call it not another demo, it's a YouTube series that we do. And when we're interviewing different vendors, um, we make sure that they never use acronyms. We call them out on them all the time because they make me crazy. But um, you know, you got IS, infrastructure as a service, and POS, uh, software as a server, serverless, microservices. These are all different aspects of uh, of cloud computing. So you might be getting servers, right? You, you actually need infrastructure. I've got a bunch of developers, they need servers. Um, so I'm gonna get a, a set of servers from Microsoft Azure. Um, 
or maybe I'm just looking for an application, right? I'm going to run, my company is now going to run Workday as my human resources. Um, so then you're talking about uh, running a full SaaS app, or maybe you just need a, a service running inside of something in the cloud. So you start talking about um, microservices. Um, serverless, a little bit of a newer um, technology where you're, you're, you're not even really getting servers, you're just getting, again, processing um, and memory. Um, it's kind of the next phase of things where we, we truly get away from having any sort of server dependency when we're trying to run any applications in the cloud. I'm going to take a quick break before we um, jump into the shared responsibility model because I think that's important. Any questions, comments, anything like that so far? Yeah, what, what is the reason behind servers only lasting a month? Uh, they just basically use them and burn them. Um, they don't want to deal with patching. Um, so what they'll do is they, they will pre-stage another truckload of servers that are all patched. And because nothing is really running on one server, right, it's all shared across all of these, they can pull that one chunk of servers out um, that's, you know, that's out now out of the patch cycle, bring in a bunch of freshly patched servers, plug it in. Um, the data all repopulates again across the, the whole data center or multiple data centers. Um, so it's really just that. It's easier for them to do that stuff offsite. Um, if there's any, there's no maintenance that gets done either. If, you know, if um, a memory card or any, anything like that starts going, they just tear it out and put in new. So that's really the biggest reason. They just don't want to spend the time. It's cheaper for them to constantly be to, to do it offsite and bring this stuff in than it is to, to try to do the kind of the traditional, like, again, they're not pets. We're not, there's no care and feeding. You get them in, you use them up, you, um, you carve them up and you get them out of there and get new ones in. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. Crazy. I mean, it's a, it's a crazy industry. Yeah. Another question that came up was, um, are there any prime examples of security as a service, which isn't listed here, but. Um. Yeah, that's, so that's interesting. Security as a service, I, I actually just had this come up in a presentation I had to do yesterday. Um, there is getting to be more security as a service. And where I'm really starting to see a lot of that is um, endpoint. Um, so people not wanting to manage the um, monitoring of their endpoints. So you're getting companies like, um, you know, Rapid7, Sentinel-1, some of the other uh, more modern um, endpoint uh, security companies that are actually offering services. We'll, we'll monitor all the stuff that's happening on your endpoints so you don't have to um, kind of thing. Um, SIM, you're starting to see some security around uh, SIM technology as well, which is like your auditing and logging uh, technology. And, uh, but I'm seeing most around the endpoint. So anybody else out there that's seen any security as a service that's seeing anything? Yeah, it's, it's. So, uh, so we just hired an MSP for KDL to assist with our server piece. And okay. that was part of it. Um, wasn't like full blown, we're taking over all your security. Um, but it was definitely a piece that was talked about. Okay. Yeah, I've seen like vulnerability management also be um, done as a service. So I think Tenable, Rapid7 again, um, have some uh, offerings in that space as well. Again, that kind of goes back to patching and a little bit to do with your service and your endpoint. But it's a lot of that mundane stuff that, um, you know, people don't have the time or don't want to do, uh, or it's hard to find people that are willing to do it kind of thing that's moving over to that security as a service. Did that answer whoever asked the question, your question? We're good? That was Stephanie, so, oh, she said, yep, it does. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I honestly, I do think that's going to continue to be a growing space as, um, you know, as, as we continue down not having enough security people uh, in the industry. Uh, even through COVID, we're, you know, we're still seeing that there's, there's almost a, a negative unemployment in security. There's still more jobs that are available than there are people that are looking for them in the security space. 
Um, so I, I will, I do think that you'll continue to see more people outsourcing some of that stuff because it's hard to find people to do it. And if you do find good security people, um, you know, which are hard to find, do you really want them patching servers or patching workstations? Uh, or do you want them, you know, really doing threat hunting and, and other important things? So growing field for sure. Are not Oh, another question was um, identity and access um, management as a service. Yeah, that's that. Uh, so SailPoint, um, not to keep throwing out vendors, but it's the world <laughs> that I live in. Um, uh, actually, uh, I'll find it and I'll post it when I'm done. Um, I just did a um, I just did a YouTube video with um, uh, one of the guys from SailPoint talking about. Um, uh, identity as a service. Um, so yes, that's whoever brought that up. Great point. That was one I missed. So yeah, getting to be more and more popular. Because one of the reasons there is um, identity, it takes a huge infrastructure to run. Um, it can be very complicated and it can, uh, you know, it, it, it can, the, the care and feeding, right? If, if we think of our technology as pets, which we're really rapidly moving away from that being there's a lot of care and feeding required um, in in the identity space. So I think that's what's really driving that. Is that user identity or device identity or both? Both. Yep. Yep. Okay. SailPoint is going to focus a little bit more on the user um, side of it, but even the word identity is changing. Uh, you know, it, it used to mean a user. Now it could mean a phone um, kind of thing. So you are starting to see, um, you know, that spread out to being a more device driven um, identity management as well. Yeah. Uh, so this to me is my favorite of any Optiv slide. And I think also the most important slide that I will share uh, this evening. Um, this is something that, so, so the shared responsibility model what is your responsibility? If you put something in the cloud or you work for a company that puts something in the cloud, what is your responsibility versus what is their responsibility? Um, <laughs> kind of like, uh, kind of like we had going on on LinkedIn today, Joanna, right? About joking about um, cloud stuff, just automatically being secure. Um, a, a lot of companies did not understand this five, six, seven years months, hours ago when they, when they were uh, sticking a bunch of uh, data out in the cloud was that, you know, if, if I'm getting infrastructure as a service from, um, you know, Azure or AWS, and then I'm putting applications out there that have a whole bunch of, you know, HIPAA or PCI or other sensitive data in them, that's not the responsibility of AWS or Microsoft to to secure that data. Um, you know, they're, they're they just give you the infrastructure. That's the part that's there. So, you know, if the the one constant across all three of these um, is is the data. So, regardless of if you're looking at an application or a, you know infrastructure, whatever it is that you're looking to put into the cloud or your company is looking to put into the cloud. Uh, the data is still your responsibility. Who has access to it? Who can access it? Who is accessing it? What are they doing with that data? What's in that data? All of that stuff is still uh, your responsibility. And honestly, that's the most important part of this, right? If we take a whole bunch of, uh, you know, if a, if a healthcare company puts a bunch of HIPAA data out in the cloud and doesn't secure it and that gets hacked um, and, Honestly, the, the cloud takes away a couple of layers that a hacker has to go through in order to get to that data. Um, you know, you, you, you're gonna have some real problems. So uh, I think, you know, especially those that are, that are just getting into the security space or, or looking to advance in it or, or looking at cloud, if you can understand and, and talk to the, the security aspect or this shared responsibility model, I think you're really setting yourself apart a little bit. A lot of people still don't understand, um, you know, this is like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna get a SaaS app. I don't have to worry about who has access to it. They're taking care of it. Not true. Um, so 
critical piece of information here. Anyone with comments, questions on this? I, I want to make sure that, that this is really understood. Yeah, so we just did an RFP um, to migrate our data center to a basically a private cloud. And this was probably 60 to 70% of the conversation to get in writing from the vendor of where they were dropping the ball and where we KDL had to take it from there. Um, and some of them are like, I don't know. <laughs> so they didn't win the contract. Um, and others were able to, you know, negotiate based on examples like this of here's where we have it. Here's where we don't have it. Yeah. And legally <laughs> where, where they have it. Um, it, it was a long conversation um, with some of the vendors just to make sure we were aware of what they are and are not doing, how they're patching, what's their procedures, and just reviewing all that process. Yeah. Um, I, so and I, I think I have something in here about contracts. Um, if another really important thing that Jared mentioned there that's super important for you to know is your you know, becoming or, or, or moving into doing cloud security. The contracts are the most important thing uh, ever, more so than I think, you know, maybe other technology contracts or whatever, because of the fact that, um, you know, you're putting what could be some of your most sensitive information out, out onto uh, the cloud you really have to go through. There's a lot of questions that you can ask, you know, find out are these companies, you know, do they get audits? Are those audits made public? How often are they audited? Who's doing their audits? Have they had any outages? Have they had any breaches that have been made public? And there's a lot of questions that can get asked of, of any cloud provider. Um, any of them that are worth their salt, certainly Microsoft, Amazon, the big ones are going to have some of that information, but even smaller ones are, you know, SaaS based, uh, you know, uh, SaaS apps, um, you know, you can still ask those questions. And, and if you are a security person that is, you know, understands that and, you know, your company is looking to bring on a new um, SaaS app and you're in those meetings and you're asking those questions, um, that makes you infinitely more valuable if, if you're able to have that conversation, right? Because now you're talking business, you're talking risk, you're talking dollars, you're talking a lot of things that, um, that people are really going to um, be appreciative that you're bringing to the table as a security person. Yeah, so um, this is Amy. Um, hey. So if you have, if you need help doing any type of third party due diligence, just basic due diligence and, and you need some questions to ask, I've done that before. So just let me know. Yeah, it's, it's, Jared, it's super if, critical. If, if, yeah, so that's a whole thing. So if you guys are <laughs> ever interested, I think we'll probably end up doing a presentation on, on third party due diligence yeah, well, um, at some yeah. point. But yeah, that's, uh, that's critical, man. Just supplier. Um, so it's, it's, uh, yeah. Ask, ask Target how important that is, right? I mean, the, the target target breach that's been used forever, that was because of an HVAC system being compromised. It wasn't actually a, a, a target. Right. So that came through a vendor. Um, yeah, and I was going to say uh, for global projects too, so if you have a third party supplier, even if they have like an image and it seems like everything is all tied up, it's really important to take what they say and figure out the implications to each and every department within your organization. Because if you don't, there could be some little file that's going to a different country or that's going to healthcare or you name it, you have to get everybody's signature yeah. on that is, is really important. Now, Regina, you are gonna get me up on my security people need to know how to talk to the business soapbox, which takes a lot for me to get <laughs> off of. That's what I do. Uh, I will try. To, I'll <laughs> yeah. try not to get too preachy there. Um, but that's kind of what I'm trying to say here too, right? We have to remember as security people that um, you know we're we're not just technical resources for your company. You are an integral part of their operations, and I think it's time for security people to uh, to up their game, uh, bring their. Uh, bring their up game or as Joanna says, or a game. Um, Just bring a game. <laughs> bring your un game. 
uh, to uh, to the table and really provide actual business understanding and knowledge, right? Um, you know, it, so I have a, a company actually that that I that I work with who did not pay it, did a outsourced uh, a whole bunch of data. Um, I'll, I'll keep this as, however, as, as scrubbed as possible. They outsourced a system that had a bunch of data into it, did not read in the contract that if they negated the contract, they didn't get the data. They decided not to continue to re-up this contract and they have oodles and oodles of business critical data that the company is not giving them back because it wasn't in the contract. The amount of money that the company wants for them to simply get their own data back is a very large six figure number um, and so now they're stuck in this pickle of, you know, it's, it's like legal ransomware almost at that point, right? This company is basically saying, look, the contract said, if you cancel, this data is ours. And, and you know, they, they didn't, um, you know, they, they didn't scour through those contracts and um, they got into a bad situation. It happens a lot. There's, there's a ton of SaaS products that are that way, even, even some large ones, um, which is crazy to think of you kind of assume that your data is your data um but it's not yeah <laughs> sometimes there there might be some some changes in the law that would prohibit that from happening um that's yeah a, isn't that yeah like, it doesn't for code. example the gdpr i mean yeah well <laughs> so yeah so code is not the same thing as data Right, but so they if, so so the the argument I've heard a lot is we created this custom site, we own the custom code, which is in our database. We cannot share that with you. Um, I mean, they can we say all know that all day. Yeah, so they can say that, and they can write it in the contract. But if it's against the law, they're going to lose that battle. Except those laws don't exist right now, right? I mean, I I don't think you can win that legal battle currently, or you'd be hard pressed to, I think, right? Or do you know of ones that are already written that way, Amy? I mean, I'm pretty sure you own your data. I mean, CCPA, which is the California Consumer Privacy Act. Yeah, but that's only if the data is in California. Um, this was all here. But doesn't it also count if you're, the CCPA, doesn't it also apply if, not only if you're in California, but what if you're a company based out of California? Yeah, yeah or if you have customers in California, there's certainly some of that, but this was a purely Michigan based run company. Um, I know they are still battling it legally, but even those costs are through the roof. Oh, yeah. All of this could have been avoided if they'd have done their due diligence up front, if their security people would have been a part of the conversations, if their legal team would have been a part of the conversations. And they would have scoured through these contracts and understood the the ramifications, right? They they could have um, certainly avoided a kind of a mess that they're in. Um, it's that, not that, an uncommon. My cash question came uh, to you about the architects because that's how I got into cybersecurity is trying to defend the architects uh, for the organization and doing that. The last two companies I've saved them millions of just saying, that's not what the architect said, we need to pull him in this conversation. And just going through the contract and saying, the, the vendor is saying this, what's the implication to the organization? The vendor is saying this, who do I need to pull in the room to have this discussion? It's such an easy, um, you know. Critical. Yes, yeah, Critical. it's easy to do, but people don't do it, they just sign. I know, I know. So I'm saying, yeah. well, this is why it's also important to have a contracts department uh, people that this is their job to read every line of that uh, information because I mean security people can do some but if you have like 19 other tasks to do that's not going to be enough but if this is this group well, job right know. so so the problem really is is you've got a set of lawyers that read these things the, <laughs> and the okay. lawyers yeah are not security professionals and they're not IT professionals. So they don't understand the impacts from a technology perspective. Like, oh, well, this contract says this, but our, you know, infrastructure cannot support this. You know? And, and likewise, the security people are not right. lawyers. So they don't understand all the legalese, right? And, and if anybody's- yeah. Yeah. Well, some, sometimes they do. <laughs> Sometimes. Your mouth. Sometimes they do. Okay. My oldest daughter is training to be a lawyer and she she's going into her last year. When I talk to her on the phone, I can already tell that she is now speaking lawyer language. Just yeah. 
a different language. So, and they might, right? And and also, I mean, I know some uh, some cyber lawyers that are pretty smart about security stuff. Yeah. But neither of them are going to be experts in the other fields. So very no. again, this is why um, you know, and Regina makes such a great point about you know, bring your security people to the table. But your security people also need to understand that they're not just technical people. They are a part of the business, and and right. So so you have to have all of this stuff working together and it's just too often does not and you run into situations like yes this. yeah I, is I would say too is uh you know from a security standpoint we need to arm the business to make a good decision because i find a lot too that the business they don't even understand their data they're just sitting there nodding their nope. hands like, okay this is what they're saying so even though and the other thing is even though right now this is okay what about six months from now? Are you about to change something that's going to make this obsolete or risky? And they go, oh, well, now that you say that, and it's like, really? <laughs> and, and you're the manager of this department? It's crazy. It's the important crazy. thing to understand about what you just said there is that none of that is a technical discussion, right? Yeah. We're not talking about processors and memory and storage and none of that. So, um, this, this is all business related conversations. And, one of the aspects of cloud is that it, it is much more closely connected to the business than I think what traditional data center IT was. Um, back when we were like keepers of the kingdom and all the data f went through, like some crazy stuff used to happen, right? Like um, I would get, when I worked on a help desk 130 years ago, um, they, you know, the, it would be like, oh, so-and-so needs access to an HR folder. You go give them access to an HR folder. Why am I the keeper of HR information, right? Like that, but that was just how that always worked. Now that we're, you know, you know, fast forward all of these years and then put stuff in the cloud and really have all these regulations and other things. That's a totally different world now. So the business also needs to understand that they have a responsibility of, of who should have access to data who shouldn't have access to data what that data is um you know it, it uh, who they're partnering with again going back to amy's comments about third party um there's there are whole industries that are being built up right now around that that third party access and knowing that now that we're in an integrated cloud environment right you've probably got contractors and vendors that have access in some way shape or form to your networks um i i always harken back to some of the, the one of the funny ones was the um the the aquarium company that put in the the new aquarium in the casino in las vegas that had an ip enabled thermometer so that they could log in and check the temperatures and other things of this aquarium that was in the uh, the lobby of this casino well, somebody hacked that thermometer and got into the corporate network through this third party vendor and took like 50 million records out of that casino. So, um, you know, the, the, I guess the cloud is kind of like a scary Godzilla monster. Um, but, uh, um, you know, you, you really have to be sure that you know who um, is responsible and, and make sure that they are taken care of. Right? That's good. Good, good conversation. All right. Um, yeah, we always love stats, right? Uh, um, this one I think is good. Boy, if you're with an organization that doesn't do multi-factor, it's not the end all be all of security, but if you have stuff that's not behind uh, at least two, two factor, if not multi-factor authentication, you're a sitting duck for, um, for attacks out there. Um, Look at your configurations. Boy, if, if you're an organization that's putting stuff in AWS or Azure, understand that their security configuration, like the base security configuration is not very good. And so um, actually we did a whole video on um, uh, securing um, Office 365, just a bunch of settings that are by default not set. Um, because again, it's not Microsoft's responsibility to have those things turned on, it's yours. So um, as a security person, you know, learn what some of these best practices are. Um, yeah, and then encryption and all this other, this is just scary, scary data here. So um, challenges in the cloud, we've, we certainly have talked through a, um, quite a bit of these, um, you know, 
I think identity we hit on a little bit. Understand that that doesn't identity is right. It's it's everywhere now. Um, everything is its own identity. Um, this, if you can, my phone will get blurred out in the screen, but um, that thing has access to a lot of stuff. Um, somebody gets access to that, they're gonna have a, a heyday. Um, you know, people with different identities. We've got applications here and applications there, and all, all this stuff, and um, so. Access management, man, I've been, it's another soapbox I've been on for 25 years. Um, I do feel like companies are finally starting to come around to it. Uh, COVID for all of the horrible things that it's done has finally got people paying attention to um, access and identity management, which is a silver lining, I guess. Um, so I'm glad to see that. Data protection, we, we kind of drilled uh, this one to death already, um, but again, there was an old saying back in the day, still used a little bit, like know thy network, um, but know thy data. Um, if you don't and it gets out there, um, you know, your, your entire company could be shut down. There was another company, uh, a little help, like a physical therapy company um, here in West Michigan, uh, Kalamazoo area or something like Paddle Creek, I think, um, that uh, got hit with a ransomware and it was... Uh, their data was fully exposed. They had no security on it. They got hit with this ransomware attack and they basically just shut the doors. It was going to be more expensive for them to recover that data and get back up and running again than it was to just call it quits. And so this, this, this is actually like life and death stuff for companies. Um, you know, if you're not protect, if as a security person, you are not helping your organization um, protect its data, especially as it goes out into the cloud, um, you're really not doing your job. Uh, visibility, we'll talk a little bit about um, logging, monitoring, all of that stuff. This is pretty much the same, I think, uh, you know, as, as what we should have always been doing on-prem. Um, you really need to know what your users are doing. You need to know where the data is moving. Uh, some of that technology didn't exist 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, it all exists now, um, and so you should definitely be doing, uh, doing all of that. Um, and then uh, your infrastructure uh, security, you know, again, um, understanding where your vulnerabilities are. How does your cloud integrate with your on-premise? Uh, again, you know, this, these two, while there are some separations, it shouldn't always be, well, though, that's an on-prem and that's a, uh, uh, that's a cloud thing. It's a lot of your processes should be the same for um, for securing those things. Well, some of the technical details might be a little different. The thought processes should still be pretty consistent across the board. Um, yes. Uh, don't uh, don't treat this like another data center um, because you don't have physical security around it. You don't have firewalls around it. At least not your own. You're in control of. Um, you don't have a lot of stuff that you DMZs and all the other sorts of protections that we, that we put around, like the moats we put around our physical castles when we're on prem. They don't exist uh, in the cloud, so don't treat it exactly the same. The lift and shift for anyone that doesn't know, lift and shift means I'm going to take this application that was running on my or uh, that was running on a server on prem and I'm just going to stick it in the cloud. Uh, that's a bad idea because there is definitely some, some differences. Um, you know, things will not run exactly the same if you do that. Um, and there's definitely some security differences there or some things that you have secured on-prem that won't work when you put it in the cloud. So you should really be looking at um, a, a better strategy for, for migrating that stuff. Um, break things down into domains. Uh, treat delivery workload uniquely. That gets pretty complicated, but certainly in the cloud, um, workloads are a little bit uh, different. So, um, you know, you do kind of have to look at each one. You're going to treat a human resources system different than you're going to treat a manufacturing system, different than you're going to treat a finance system, different than you're going to treat some back end system. So, um, you know, make sure that you're paying attention. You, you may be doing security a little bit different, um, depending on what type of a system that it is. Uh, Requirements and use cases, that just goes into straight up planning, right? Always make sure that you're doing planning up front. Again, that goes that that goes back to the lift and shift, right? Really understand what is this application? What are the benefits of me moving to the to the cloud? 
don't just move stuff to the cloud because it seems cool um, because chances are pretty good that it's probably going to be more expensive. And it's if your company has a data center that they're not trying to get out of, it might be cheaper and easier and just as good to leave some of those things running in the data center. Um, I, another company I was working with here, they decided to do a lift and shift of a major system this last year. And uh, they, they had a budget planned out from their on-prem. They figured that would be about the same because the cloud was supposed to be cheaper. Uh, by May of that year, they were out of budget. They had already spent the entire budget um, and then were scrambling to try to figure out how to get seven more months worth of budget from a company from a very critical system. Uh, needless to say, the extra hundreds of thousands of dollars was not uh, of spend was not appreciated. Um, know those configurations, identity, automation as well. Um, automation, Joanna, we could, that could be a whole topic. Um, uh, cheesy IT joke thing that everybody has to throw into a deck. Um, these are just some stuff. I won't read through this. You guys can see some of these things. Um, uh, as far as the fundamentals of some things that you should be learning and understanding um, about the cloud. So this is, this is your new data center. If you're working for a startup company, chances are they won't even have a data center. You might be all cloud. Um, I don't know very many companies that are putting any money into new data centers or any sort of on-prem apps. So um, that infrastructure uh, as, a, as a service and, you know, having everything going out there is really uh, happening fast right now. Um, how are we doing on time? I feel like I've been talking forever, so. Oh, no, you're good. I, I feel like if you want to go back to that previous slide. Sure. Okay, so big things that I see in my world are um, segmentation is huge and containerization is it's not new, but it's becoming really, really popular, guys. It's becoming, a I mean, Chris knows way more than, and Matt probably knows way more than, than I do, but you know, like Kubernetes is a thing, right? So <laughs> I think it's Kubernetes. Is that right, Kubernetes? Kubernetes, I've heard it pronounced. Kubernetes. Yeah. Kubernetes, okay. But yes, it's, it's, um, it's a new way to, to um, safeguard data, um, yes. So it's it's a, a containerization. So if you guys want to learn something from a security perspective, segmentation, containerization is a huge thing in my world. Yeah, yeah that again could be its own presentation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> about containers, right? Where it's, you're really trying to keep everything in a little box and not allow any cross pollination to happen there. Yeah. Oh gosh, the segmentation piece could be a whole. I mean, yeah, it could be a whole thing because just for a network perspective, not just, you know, server perspective. So is my high level of Kubernetes understanding is Kubernetes is basically the automation of containerization. Is that good from a high level or is that wrong? It's an um, orchestration system. So yeah, it is the uh, automation uh, automating those containers and buckets and all that good stuff, yeah. Yeah. I, I thought Kubernetes was the containers, like the whole platform to build the containers. Chris, <laughs> are you there? Help yeah, us out. I'm here. Uh, <laughs> okay. it's, it's, an, it's basically, it's the orchestration architecture you build the containers inside of. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. And, yeah, so it's a deployment architecture that you would use. You build them inside and then you deploy it, but it's pretty much a sort of full orchestration platform for it. Right, for containers. So it's sort of separate from containers, but it enables the containers to work. Uh, yep. like it should, That's where you build them. Containers. Yeah. Correct. So it's like I a work with, Yeah. I work with DevOps team, so we're in containers and big bu in buckets and stuff all day long. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, and actually, um, John, I mean, that was a good point about the 95% of security incidents customers fall. I mean, it's, you know what's interesting in a cloud, I don't know if Matt hit it, and I apologize for my tardiness, but um, you know, in a lot of cases, the security and safety capabilities are there for organizations to use and to be effective with if they approach it in such a way as they want to use it, as opposed to just chucking stuff up there and hoping for the best in a lot of cases. 
Yeah, and sadly, a lot of companies did that several years ago, and they're now having to, you know, like re-engineer everything that they just threw out there several years ago. Um, yeah. Sometimes, sadly, after breaches have happened, uh, when they or you know, and, uh, or or they don't even know what all is out there, right? So, um, which kind of harkens back to the um, shadow IT days and whatever. And there's still some of that, but it's a little bit different now because companies will have stuff in place to at least know when new things are getting spun up. But um, can we add an issue onto that, Matt? <laughs> What's that? Companies will sometimes know right. or when. <laughs> so I have a question along those lines. Uh, how many of you all, when you spin up a new project, have a set of current cloud architecture documentation you use as an input? I think it depends on the size of the company, right? So I'm gonna, um, hang on one second. Because I always want that, and then people always look at me like I have a duck on my head. It's like, uh, I shouldn't start requirements from a blank page. This is a whole organization here. You are going to be, there There are, and this is coming from the attacker's standpoint, and also somebody who goes into the VC, so uh, there are very few organizations that have their shit together when it comes to understanding what cloud architecture that they actually have. Um, very few. <laughs> It's an amazing question, and quite honestly, don't ever stop asking it, even if they look at you like you got a duck in your freaking head. Yeah, um, I was just in the back of the valley. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm starting from, from nothing? Yeah. I'll, I'll plug the Cloud Security Alliance a little bit. Um, if anyone is in doing anything in the cloud or your organization is, they've really already built these controls out there. So um, look up the cloud controls matrix that the CSA has. This literally as it's, it's all there, uh, all the stuff that you should be doing, at least from a baseline perspective, in terms of securing the cloud. Um, they've really done a great job. It's living, breathing, they change it as it needs to. Um, it's a really good resource. And you can also use it for third party due diligence as well. So basically- Yeah, they have like the star registry, which is part of that as well. I mean, the Cloud Security Alliance definitely has a ton of great resources out there. Um, all right, let me have my vote. <laughs> all right, back to presentation. No, I got another slide. Hold on. I'm just, I, <laughs> I got to push Matt. Do you want me to be done? I'm like, gone too long. I'm like, get no. off. <laughs> Matt is trying to stop halfway. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, let me, uh, no. let me get back to where I was. If I can make my computer work, it would be even better. Um, but it, but it, but it, where is the PowerPoint? There we go. All right. I think this is where we left off, right? Um, the one last thing to, to say on this slide, look at this stuff again, right? It's identity and data, identity and data, identity and data, identity and data. We've, I've said it a hundred times. Um, identity and data. That's whatever, right? And that's what they're after. <laughs> Identities to get to data. So if you're not controlling those wherever they are, um, and that could be in a data center, in a cloud, in someone's pocket. Um, you better have some, some definite controls around identity and data. Let's see, did we go into this one? I think we've talked through a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, I, I did talk a little bit earlier about, you know, really interrogate those cloud providers, uh, you know, ask questions. You're their customer. Um, you know, you go to, to a car dealership and you ask them questions. You might not know what the answers mean like me, but I do ask the questions. Um, but at least you're asking the questions. Know what the documentation is. Know what the contracts say. Do your third party research on all of this. Um, you know, really make sure that you know who it is that you're, you're trusting with your business. Um, let me scroll through some of this stuff here and see. Uh, uh, so I did talk about some of the frameworks that are out there. Um, these are a whole lot of logos of different things that you can pick and choose of things to become um, familiarized with. Uh, I'm sure nobody knows all of them. I certainly don't. But, um, you know, some of the big ones here, certainly ISO, of course, um, the Cloud Security Alliance, if you are talking anything that's purely cloud driven is, is certainly is a big one. 
um, and then some of the other side tail PCI. These, these are all things that are frameworks that um, you know, govern stuff that's happening in the cloud and beyond, certainly as well, but um, areas, things that you can look at, GDPR certainly does not, GDPR doesn't end just because you put something in the clouds. Um, I think we kind of talked through some of this governance stuff, uh, at least be able to go back. Um, cloud, configurations. Identities are not just people. Jared, there's there's that point. Um, identities now can be anything, right? Um, emerging APIs, automation. Um, so APIs, for anyone that doesn't know, is sort of the abilities to connect different systems together. Um, one thing that I do preach a lot is that, um, and one thing that's made me crazy about a lot of security tools that have been out there over the years, is that they're an island unto themselves and they do not play well with others. And if I'm trying to help someone put together a security portfolio or a program, uh, you know, I don't wanna have security tool over here that doesn't share data over here, or I have to collect the same logs four different times because nothing's together, or I'm stuck stuffing all of these logs into a SIM and then trying to sort through 400 billion lines of code, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, certainly, I think it's important uh, as you're looking at cloud tools and cloud management tools or, or even the, the cloud platforms themselves. Um, understand how, how well they connect uh, to other things. Make sure that you've got, um, you understand their configurations and are able to do their security. So, um, with that, uh, I didn't, this isn't my deck, so I did not put Dilbert in there, but um, any questions on anything that we talked about today? Okay, so at, <laughs> sorry, everybody at home is talking. So I, I asked a question earlier, it's about transferable skills for um, cloud computing. In a lot of interviews, they ask if you have cloud skills, and I don't because I haven't worked with any cloud service, but I do work on in-house servers so what are some of the transferable skills for um, cloud? Hmm, that's a, that's a good question. Um, uh, I mean, from a, from a purely like break fix standpoint, it's a little